Thank you everyone for coming to another Philosophy of Physics seminar. This week, we're very happy to have Ted Jacobson here. Uh, um, Ted is, in my opinion, one of the most profound thinkers in quantum gravity, very conceptual. <laughs> he is involved with uh, the origins of loop quantum gravity. He has tremendous work in thermodynamics uh, and general relativity, derivation of the Einstein equations for thermodynamic arguments. Um, he is uh, also lately ha has been working in causal diamonds in, in, within general relativity and has also been lately interested in the history uh, of general relativity. And so it is with great pleasure that we welcome you to talk. Thank you. Thank you. No battery. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah. We didn't just see. Is there a closer? It might be in the way now. Oh, there you go. I think this might be the first time I've spoken in front of a philosophy audience, at least in their own uh, home turf. Um, so I'm a little bit nervous about that, but I basically think it's a great topic or a philosophy talk. Um, I chose it for that reason, partly because, you know, there are fuzzy, there are a lot of fuzzy, difficult issues in this topic. And it's actually one of the areas in physics, modern theoretical physics, where I think philosophy of physics actually may be helpful because physicists have trouble parsing out their own um, preconceptions and assumptions that are not spoken and things like that. Uh, I'm just a physicist, but I like to try to think of it from that side and I'll try to present it from somewhat that side, but it's basically an invitation to philosophers to think about the problems as well, philosophers of physics. And I'm just giving you my take on this interesting paradox. Of course, I'll tell you what it is. Just very briefly, in case you're looking at slides later, this is key references that relate to what I'll be speaking about. I know that's very small text here for you, but the first one is a paper by Don Merrill that affected me, uh, my thinking a lot, which I'll describe. Then I wrote a very short paper uh, in 2012, and then a longer one with Fu Wen in 2019, trying to get a little bit more precise about it. And finally, towards the end of the talk, I'm actually gonna summarize a key result from this paper by other authors from last year, which I think is very germane to the topic. So the topic begins with Hawking's 1975 uh, paper on the breakdown of predictability and gravitational collapse. The key statement from the abstract is that uh, the new limitation arises because general relativity allows the causal structure of space-time to be very different from that of Minkowski space. That is to have a, a region that's hidden from the outside world causally. And he summarizes the situation that the black hole creates particles in pairs, with one particle always falling into the hole and the other possibly escaping to infinity, because part of the information about the state of the system is lost down the hole, the final situation is represented by a density matrix rather than a pure quantum state. This is because in the Hawking process, uh, the particles that are created in pairs are in entangled quantum states. The variable that's entangled is the occupation number of the mode in question, and it goes for all modes. And also, of course, anything that fell into the black hole that formed it or fell in subsequently might have carried some information that appears to be thereafter hidden from the outside world. So Hawking quite reasonably inferred that from the outside world viewpoint, information is not conserved and a pure state evolves to a mixed state. Now, there was a lot of reaction against this idea, and I'm just summarizing here or listing here three of the key arguments that were given to contest the contest Hawking's uh, inference. One was just that you know quantum mechanics just wouldn't make sense if the outside evolution were not described by a unitary 
time evolution because that's the way quantum mechanics works. I, these are all arguments that I never found convincing. I'm just putting them up to explain that they were very much in discussion. I mean, basically the first argument misses the whole point that Hawking was making, which is that the interior is cut off from the outside, but it doesn't mean that there isn't space time in there. And it's possible that inside a black hole, there's a, a bounce to another branch of the universe and that we just have a kind of um, entanglement of information outside the black hole and in the new branch of the universe. And that would be perfectly unitary in the big world picture, just not outside. And so what's wrong with not having it unitary outside? Then there was an argument that, well, if it's not unitary outside and microscopic black holes can form and evaporate in the vacuum, that would lead to massive uh, violation of energy and momentum conservation. But um, a pretty convincing counter argument to that was given explicitly by Unruh and Wald. And uh, I, so I never bought that argument. And then similarly related to these microscopic black hole pairs was the idea that um, if, if black holes really just uh, evaporate, uh, taking away with them all of the many, many states that could have been hidden inside, then a mini black hole that has almost no mass or even no mass could have an uncountable, an arbitrary number of internal states. And this would be like a particle with a huge number, an unbounded number of internal degrees of freedom. And such a particle could be, if you look at pair creation of such a particle, uh, it would be weighted by the number of final states the particle could appear in. And if the particle had an infinite number of internal states, then the amplitude for creating it would be infinite, and so uh, there would be too many mini black holes created out of the vacuum. I also never accepted that argument because it really involves an extrapolation of um, what's actually a macroscopic deformation of the fabric of space-time and just treating it like, a, like another quantum field would treat uh, particle creation. And I think you can argue that we don't know at all that that argument is valid. So I never accepted those. And for quite a number of decades, I was on the camp on Hawking's side, um, thinking that information is lost. It's no big deal. Get over it. And probably it goes down a baby universe inside the black hole or something like that. But it's just not a problem. I think an example of a proponent who still holds that view quite thoughtfully is Bob Walt. He's recently given talks saying he still believes that. Um, but I don't actually still believe that anymore, or at least I think there's a good reason to entertain the alternate viewpoint. And what turned me around, uh, what opened my mind to the alternative were two things. One is this argument of Marolf that I just mentioned, which I'll say again, and the other is the advent of ADS-CFT holographic description of space-time. Um, so I'll go into both of these, but uh, the key thing is that Merolf's argument is for unitarity at the boundary of space-time. That is that any information initially available at the boundary is always available and is never lost. And the argument is based on diffeomorphism invariance of gravity theory. And ADS-CFT, while well, it emerged from string theory, string theory that includes gravity, and gravity is diffeomorphism invariant, general relativity is so string theory, if anything, is some kind of the symmetry of it is an enlargement of that diffeo invariance. So also in the ADS-CFT context, the possibility of a holographic description of space-time hinges on diffeomorphism invariance. So I would infer, and I think it's reasonable to infer that if it's true that no information is lost, the reason why hinges crucially on diffeomorphism invariance. Now, what's the paradox? The paradox is that if we just use the semi-classical analysis of quantum field theory in a background of a space-time that has a black hole that forms from collapse and evaporates slowly, some giant macroscopic, semi slowly evolving semi-classical black hole, it looks like that quantum field theory analysis is perfectly well justified. The approximations are extremely good, and it predicts information loss. That's just Hawking's original argument. So 
how can we reconcile this prediction of information loss with boundary unitarity based on diffeomorphism invariance? Is that's the paradox that we have two good apparently lines of reasoning that come to opposite conclusions. I'd like to say that my basic starting point is if the only reason why we think that information actually may not be lost hinges on diffeomorphism invariance, then of course, to resolve the paradox, we had better hew closely to diffeomorphism invariance as a central ingredient in the analysis. This seems kind of like an obvious point to me, but it's most of the work that's been done over the decades on puzzling over the information paradox has completely ignored diffeomorphism invariance until recently. And I just feel that was a, a blunder. As you'll see by the end of the talk, I think that it's likely that by keeping in mind and keeping track of the implications of diffeomorphism invariance, the paradox can be resolved. Since this is a philosophy uh, group talk, I thought I would quote a philosopher of physics, David Wallace, I guess came out of Oxford actually. Um, from his viewpoint, he wrote a nice paper, why black hole information loss is paradoxical. Um, and he gave basically two reasons, one of which is the second one I gave, the ADS-CFT evidence. Uh, but he also gave this other one, which is based on the idea that since apparently black holes behave like thermodynamic objects in every way perfectly, they satisfy the generalized second law, the spectrum of radiation is perfectly thermal, modified by scattering. <clears throat> and um, it would just be, it's impossible to see how an object could behave perfectly consistently with the laws of thermodynamics if it wasn't in every respect like a thermodynamic body, in which case it would be described by quantum mechanics. I don't find that argument as convincing as the others, but I sort of get the thrust of it. Anyway, that was um, his other argument. And uh, his, the way he put the thing at the end was, um, it remains in the truest sense paradoxical, a compelling argument for a conclusion, a comparably compelling argument for the conclusion's negation, Thus, we find ourselves in the enviable situation of having an interesting problem with no really satisfying answer. If we're lucky, this means we we'll learn something deep. I think in a sense, we do learn something deep, which is about overarching implications of diffeomorphism invariance in quantum gravity. So let me now let's summarize a little more, uh, well, actually state concisely what Merolf's 2008 argument about boundary unitarity was. So diffeomorphism invariance of the theory implies that the Hamiltonian is a linear combination of constraints indicated by C here. C sub A A is a space-time index, uh, smeared against the lapse and shift and integrated over a spatial slice of space, plus a boundary term, which I've just indicated as lowercase h here, at the boundary of a spatial slice. And you notice I have a, a boundary here that is time-like. So this is a picture of an asymptotically anti-decitter space-time. And I'm going to stick in this discussion to that setting, even though, of course, we probably don't live in an asymptotically anti-decitter space-time, but it's a very convenient setting to discuss the problem in because the boundary, this is actually a, a conformal compactification. So this anti-decitter space is infinitely big in radius, but applying a scale factor that goes to zero at infinity, we can bring the infinite uh, distance to a finite location. And that's what the boundary of the cylinder represents. So, and the fact is you can see that, so as usual in space-time diagrams, time is going up and light travels at 45 degrees here. So this is a time-like translation at the boundary. So the boundary has a time translation symmetry actually. And that's useful because then we can talk about physics of observers that extend through time at the boundary and what they see, whether their information changes or not. And I do think that it's fine to restrict attention to this unphysical perhaps setting 
to address this paradox, because if it can be resolved in this setting, then I think I would imagine the ingredients of the resolution would translate to other settings. This is, of course, also the setting of ADS CFT duality. So the meaning of this Hamiltonian is that it generates translations in time where the surface sigma, its boundary would move up at the boundary in time like that. And in the interior, it could be deformed in various ways, but those would correspond to diffeomorphisms in the bulk. And that part of the evolution, the deformation of the surface sigma is generated by these, this constraint term in the bulk. Now, key thing is that an observable in, should be diffeomorphism invariant because diffeomorphisms are the gauge symmetry of the theory. So it wouldn't be, they would have no observable significance if it wasn't invariant under diffeomorphisms. So if an observable O has that property, it should have zero plus and bracket uh, classically and zero commutator quantum mechanically with these constraints, which are a function of position in space. Um, I should mention that strictly speaking, it's really not the constraint itself at a point, but we should smear the constraint with lapse and shift to form the generator of a particular kind of diffeomorphism that this commutes with. And only if the lapse and shift go to zero at the boundary, so only if we're just deforming the surface in the middle without moving it on the boundary, does that count as a gauge transformation. And so strictly speaking, that's what should appear here is the um, constraint smeared with such lapses and shift. Now, time evolution in quantum mechanics is generated by you know, unitary transformation, where an, an observable in the Heisenberg picture is conjugated by e to the minus ih times the Hamiltonian, and then the conjugate of that on the other side. And if the observable commutes with the constraints, then this bulk term in the Hamiltonian uh, gives zero in this construction. And so it reduces to just the boundary Hamiltonian uh, conjugating evolution, conjugating this observable. So suppose now that this observable, instead of living everywhere, is localized at the boundary. It's, so it's some observable that observers sitting at the boundary can observe. Well, the Hamiltonian in this formula is also living at the boundary. So this expression involves the products of operators at the boundary. And if the product of two observables that are localized at the boundary is also localized at the boundary, which seems like it stands to reason, then uh, this implies that the time evolution of a boundary observable is another boundary observable. It's a key assumption, which is not completely clear, I fully admit, I would say. The notion of a, an algebra of boundary observables that can be localized at the boundary and which under unitary conjugation like this with another boundary operator, oops. Why did I bounce to that, hold on. Um, remains in the algebra of boundary observables, I would say that's a technical claim or statement that hasn't, to my mind, been fully established. It's kind of plausible. It's a weak point in the whole line of reasoning that I'm going to describe because the whole thing hinges on that being true. Um, and so I think it deserves actually a lot more technical study to what extent that's really true. When Merrill made this argument, he just treated it as self-evident, and it does seem physically sensible, but um, it's potentially a weak point. Sorry, Ted, very quickly, he treated what to self-evident, that the observables are boundary observables? That, it may, that there is an algebra of boundary localized observables, and that when they are conjugated by the Hamiltonian, which is purely a boundary term, they the conjugation remains another, another element of the algebra of boundary observables. Okay, that's absolutely key to the whole argument. So if that statement is wrong, then everything else I'm saying is wrong. Actually, not everything else. I'll tell you something else that's independent of it later, but much of what I'm saying would be wrong. <laughs>
But, but it doesn't require that all observables be boundary observables. Right. No, it certainly doesn't. I tried in my paper with Fook to formalize the notion of the boundary observable. I'll mention a tiny bit about it later. But I still think it's it's involves some real technical issues that haven't been analyzed closely. <laughs> okay, but let's grant Meroff this, uh, let's say, conjecture or statement at this point. Then what's the implication? It's that information present at the boundary at one time remains present forever. Because suppose we uh, send in some burst of radiation or matter that collapses and forms a black hole in there, carries away some information. If we start with a pure state in the boundary, then at every time we can recover exactly the information that we started with because the boundary, the time evolution of the boundary observable algebra initially is the same as the algebra at later times. I could just work backwards to figure out with this, there's some observable in later times that recovers all the information I had initially. So no information can ever be lost or gained in this scenario. This is fundamentally different from the usual description of the situation in the black hole information paradox. There one says a black hole forms, it starts emitting Hawking radiation. The radiation is in a mixed state. So Hawking radiation arrives at the boundary in an impure quantum state. And it's not until later on, let's say halfway through the time of the evaporation of the black hole, that somehow the missing information is recovered because of correlations between the late Hawking quanta and the earlier ones or something like that. Here, the picture is completely different. No information is ever lost. That would be the picture. Now, before I talk about how that would be implemented, no information lost in situations where you think it would get lost, I just wanted to mention analogies with um, other paradoxes in physics and just reflect on how, in general, paradoxes in physics get resolved. So I've listed here four of which ours is the last one. So the Gibbs paradox, the non-zero entropy of resulting from the mixing of identical particles in let's say a gas. Uh, the twin paradox that you've got two different paths between the same space-time points, but the time elapsed is actually different. The EPR paradox, which is that we have elements of reality that don't seem to be described or captured by quantum mechanics and the black hole information paradox that black holes don't destroy information. In all of these cases, I think the, res the resolution is found not by forbidding the scenario that seemed to raise the paradox, nor by modifying the theory in a way that resolves the paradox, Rather, it's by looking closely at the lessons of the theory in front of us to figure out and to pay attention to what's a meaningful statement about the world in that theory. The paradox always results from thinking that some statement is meaningful when it isn't really. So in the Gibbs case, the illegitimate uh, distinction between identical particles, if, there's no, if they're truly identical and no observation can distinguish them, then uh, we shouldn't pretend that there's a hidden label on them that actually does distinguish them, because that's completely unobservable in the theory, and that resolves this paradox. There's no actual entropy increase. The twin paradox, of course, the illegitimate notion of an absolute time. EPR paradox, the illegitimate notion that every system, that, that the world is made of Subsist that, that every state in the world can be composed by bringing together states of subsystems, as opposed to having states that are states of the whole and can't be subdivided. And finally, in the case of black holes, uh, as I'm arguing, it's the illegitimate notion of local observables. You'll see why I say the key is local observables. So just to restate uh, so the main points of the talk in case you fall asleep, um, boundary unitarity, BU, uh, is plausibly sound in quantum mechanics, but I'll argue not in classical mechanics due to a lack of analyticity. 
So there's something special about quantum mechanics that makes this argument work because it's clearly not true. I'll, I'll, I'll illustrate why it's not true in, in classical mechanics. Uh, the black hole information paradox is a special case of another paradox, which I call the boundary information paradox, which actually has nothing to do with black holes. I recently was asked to give a talk at another place, and I offered three topics, and the guy who um, was inviting me said, oh yeah, do the black hole information paradox. I, I love black holes. And I said, well, Actually, I'm going to argue that it has nothing to do with black holes. And he said, "Okay, I want one of the other <laughs> of the other talks." Um, anyway, I'll, I'll explain to you what the boundary information paradox is and why I think um, that's the right way to look at the paradox. And finally, that the resolution does not require a breakdown of known physics, like a firewall. You may have heard of a firewall proposal or a breakdown of local quantum field theory, like in some kind of non-local jumping over the horizon on some controlled way, but rather just a better accounting for the impact of diffeomorphism invariance on the global structure of the Hilbert space and, and its observables. Okay, so now getting a little bit into specifics about this boundary algebra. So here's a, a picture of a little piece of the boundary and a spatial slice sigma. And how do we try to say what we mean by a boundary localized observable? Well, we could consider the intersection of our spatial slice with the time-like uh, boundary here and consider this little blue lens is an open neighborhood of that intersection. And then if we have an observable that can be constructed in any arbitrarily small open neighborhood of that intersection, I would call that, propose that that's what a boundary localized observable is. Um, and actually, this is just restating the argument that I gave before. The Hamiltonian is in that algebra A sub boundary, then its commutator with uh, anything else in the algebra is presumably also in that A sub boundary, therefore the time derivative with respect to boundary time of the observable is back in the boundary algebra. And therefore, if you integrate this equation, um, you get that the boundary algebra just evolves into itself unitarily. So no information is lost. It's like a Heisenberg picture formulation of no information loss. Now this is known to be false in classical mechanics. So the analog of this quantum mechanical statement is we'd have the plus and bracket instead of the commutator here. And then when we exponentiate this time, uh, this differential equation to get a solution with the unitary operator in, in classical mechanics, instead we're exponentiating the operation of taking plus and bracket with the Hamiltonian. And the fact is, and this has to be interpreted as an infinite series. You expand this exponential into um, a power series. Each term is some nested commutator of n copy, n, n plus some brackets of the Hamiltonian with the observable. And so then the question is, does that series converge uh, to the observable at time t? And the answer is no, if the initial data is not analytic. So in our paper with Fook, we just constructed a simple example in, class, in classical field theory showing explicitly how this works. But a nicer example in the present context is to use gravity. And there is actually a beautiful example I want to just tell you about. So this is called Corvino gluing. Um, so the statement is this. I was quite surprised when I learned about this. It's apparently well known to mathematical relativists, uh, somebody named Corvino first came up with this construction and it's been quite generalized since. It's gravitational screening to a degree that you might've thought was impossible. So suppose we stick inside space-time, some star here, some very non-symmetrical object, that's let's say a, a source of gravity, and it could be gravitational waves or whatever, anything that's not spherically symmetric. Apparently, it's always possible to take exactly that solution 
uh, to the Einstein constraint equations inside and take exactly some appropriate Schwarzschild, actually in general, it would be Kerr, but if there's no angular momentum here, Schwarzschild is good enough. In this case, I'm an asymptotically anti-de Sitter, so Schwarzschild anti-de Sitter solution outside, exactly. And then in the overlap region between uh, the Schwarzschild anti-de Sitter part and the interior star part, make some kind of a deformation of the initial data here that matches it on perfectly with the Schwarzschild solution here. The Schwarzschild solution mass is determined by whatever is inside. And if there's angular momentum, you also have to allow for angular momentum here. But otherwise, all the other multiple moments of whatever is inside here can be completely washed out by putting some appropriate deformation of initial data here. Therefore, if you live outside at the boundary at this time, you see an exact Schwarzschild solution, let's say, you have no inkling that there's something funny inside. And this is a true statement about general relativity classically. But of course, if you time evolve this initial data, then the signal that you have this star there will propagate out to the boundary at the speed of light. And at this point, the boundary observer will go, oh, what's, what happened? It's not Schwarzschild anymore. So that's like a violation of boundary unitarity in the classical theory, boundary information. There's nothing in the algebra of observables here that could have told you that this was going to arrive. Okay. But it's different in quantum mechanics because it's just a true fact that if the if the commutator equation that I wrote before holds, the time derivative is the commutator with the Hamiltonian, and at least for um, a bounded observable, oh, this really is the solution. This unitary conjugation of that observable is the solution to the, the first order time evolution equation that I wrote down. So in that case, there's no room for this Corvina, for this uh, gravitational screening effect to take place. The entire boundary observable uh, Observable algebra just evolves unitarily. There's something strangely very different. And the key thing is, you, is some kind of analyticity property of, the, of quantum mechanics that isn't shared by classical mechanics. You'll see at the end of the talk, like how that plays out in actually picking out the information. Like what is it in the algebra that captures this information? It must be something rather subtle. So now let me explain what I said was um, my version of the black hole information paradox, which is the boundary information paradox. So there's no black hole yet. I'll bring one in later. But for now, let's just do the following thought experiment. So this is, again, asymptotically anti-dissider space. I inject this blue uh, shell of matter at some particular time from the boundary, and it's self-gravitating. Um, so there's some gravitational field, but it's not collapsed enough to make a black hole. So it's just some configuration. And let's imagine that in the moment of uh, collapse, it emits some early radiation that does reach the boundary at this time. But then it leaves over something I'm calling a resonance, just some long-lived state. It's an excited state of whatever it was that I sent in there. that lives for some long time and then finally decays and spits out some late radiation. So it's quite possible then, if this whole thing is described by quantum mechanics, that the early radiation comes out, according to semi-classical analysis, in a mixed state, because it could be, it's in a state that's quantum mechanically entangled with the state of the resonance. Eventually, the late radiation comes in together, the early and late radiation, of course, would be in a pure state. It's like the picture of, you know, yeah, the burning, uh, the burning lump of coal example, it's often used to distinguish from a black hole. If you heat up a lump of coal with a pure state laser beam, of course, photons that come out of it will be in mixed states because they're entangled with what's left behind. But if you gather up everything at the end, it should, it should be in some pure state. 
Okay, so that's okay, but that violates boundary unitarity, it seems, because what happens if I'm just living at the boundary here? I pick up the early radiation. It looks like, oh, something arrived in a mixed state. I haven't evolved my boundary state unitarily, but I just told you earlier that general principles imply that the boundary algebra evolves unitarily. That, if that's true, it must be that at this early time, long before the late radiation ever arrives, there must be something else I can also measure in the, in the boundary here that will be quantum mechanically correlated to this radiation and would reveal that actually I had a pure state. There's no new information coming out here that I didn't already have. So uh, we need to, we'd like to understand what is the nature of that information? Where is it hiding? That's why it's paradoxical. It's just not clear where it could possibly be hiding. Um, okay, so that's the question. So how, how can we resolve this question? One possibility I just want to mention up front, it's related to the caveat I said earlier. Maybe it's not really true after all that the Hamiltonian is in the boundary algebra. So when we argued that it was, we were using general relativity and diffeomorphism invariance and the standard like Arnowit, Desner, Misner construction of the Hamiltonian in GR, which localizes to the boundary. But you know, general relativity is not an ultraviolet complete quantum theory. Maybe it's embedded in string theory or some other theory that has non-locality built into it. And maybe in that theory, the Hamiltonian isn't really localized at the boundary. And maybe that gives an escape hatch for this conclusion. But I don't think that's very plausible, even though I admit that it's logically possible. Because you know, this process we're looking at here, this could be a very low energy, extremely low energy process, just not hardly probing quantum you know, the ultraviolet completion of quantum gravity at all, it should be possible to use the low energy effective quantum gravity theory. Um, also, just to mention, by the time the radiation reaches the boundary, it's, it's highly redshifted. In fact, infinitely redshifted as it reaches the boundary. So the energy of anything being seen at the boundary is very low. So the idea that the ultraviolet completion of a theory is needed to make the proper analysis isn't very plausible. Well, if it's not that, what could it be? It could be what I, uh, Fook and I gave the name nebulons. And this is my answer to the resolution of the paradox. So what is a nebulon? Uh, I'll tell you where the name came from in a second. So the basic idea is the gravitational Hilbert space is not a product of local factors because the gravitational constraints, in particular the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, tie together everything in space in a non-local way. So they imply a globally non-local entanglement structure of the degrees of freedom uh, of, a, of a quantum gravity state. <clears throat> so I think that's the resolution of the paradox. Again, I'm gonna zoom in through the talk more and more precisely on what the nebulons are, but just to say why they're called nebulons. After I proposed this idea of boundary unitarity, so resolving the firewall paradox, one of the firewall paradox authors, actually all of them, um, wrote an uh, apologia for firewalls, like follow-up firewall paper, in which they briefly in a half a sentence addressed my proposal. My proposal came from one of the authors, that is Don Merrill. But strangely to my mind, he did not think that um, that boundary unitarity was sufficient to escape the firewall paradox. They asserted in this paper that nebulous bulk degrees, I was appealing to bulk degrees of freedom, like I just mentioned, somehow were purifying the asymptotic Hawking quanta. But I didn't pinpoint what they were. So these guys called them nebulous and said nebulous bulk degrees of freedom could play no role in resolving the firewall paradox. So I decided to adopt their name, nebulons, for the thing that resolves the paradox. So who are the nebulons? Um, so one way to see what they are is boundary algebra precursors, that is backwards time-evolved observables. 
let me go back to this picture and point to what I mean. So there is some observable that corresponds to observing this late radiation state here, right? But since the boundary algebra evolves unitarily, I could just evolve that observable backwards in time to the early radiation. It'll be some very weird observable where here it could be a very simple observable. You just have a detector of radiation localized at the boundary and it goes ping. But evolved backwards in time, it's some non, completely non-local, difficult to get your hands on, nebulous observable. But it actually does contain the information about the entanglement between the late and early radiation. That backwards time evolved observable has been called a precursor in other contexts. So I, I called it that here. But note that these precursors are non perturbative in Newton's constant. So that would seem to indicate they're going to be extremely hard to get our hands on. Why are they non perturbative? Well, let's just look at the Hamiltonian. So if we try to describe the situation perturbatively, we say the space-time metric is the <coughs> anti-decider space-time metric, constant curvature plus some perturbation. And we factor out the square root of Newton's constant so that this perturbation would behave as a canonically normalized quantum field, with canonical commutators. Now, uh, if we take the Hamiltonian, the ADM Hamiltonian, that boundary term has a one over Newton's constant in front of it, and then times radial derivatives of the metric, which means radial derivatives of this term, which means square root of G times radial derivatives of H, of the metric of the quantum field H. So one square root is canceled, but we're left with a square root of G in the denominator. And that means that this is non-perturbative in G, because as G goes to zero, it blows up. Okay, I thought that would actually be the answer. It is non-perturbative, that's too bad. It makes it very hard to um, get a handle on. But then a paper came along last year that showed that actually the key fact at play here is perturbatively capturable not by time evolution, but by looking at the wheeler DeWitt constraint and what it implies about uh, information in a state of quantum gravity. By the way, how am I doing on time? I think I'll end early, probably. <clears throat> okay, so the statement is, even at the perturbative level, it's been argued recently that the diffeomorphism constraints, particular, um, well, they imply that measurements in an infinitesimal time band at the boundary, that really means any arbitrarily short but finite time band, um, suffice to determine the solution to the Wheeler DeWitt equation. So, given any two solutions to the Wheeler DeWitt equation, you can distinguish them by measurements at the boundary alone. So any information they contain is accessible at the boundary. This is a striking, almost shocking statement, I would say. And I wanna tell you a little bit about how it was argued just in one slide. It's a complicated long paper, um, but I just think it's very well worth summarizing the statement and a little bit the ingredients in the argument. The paper is by Chowdhury, Godet, Papa Dulaki, and Suvrat Raju. Uh, here's the archive number. And just to state formally again, uh, what precisely what observables they say you need to distinguish these states. So if two pure or mixed states of the theory, so what they're doing, yeah, I should say. So they're taking quantum gravity, uh, expanded in Newton's constant, possibly with matter fields coupled to gravity, and using the effective quantum gravity theory for which we don't need anything other than standard effective field theory methods to analyze the meaning of the, the implication of the Wheeler-DeWitt equation. <clears throat> In that context, then um, if you have two pure or mixed states of the theory that coincide at the boundary of anti-de-sitter or asymptotically anti-de-sitter space-time for any, for any arbitrarily short time interval, they must coincide everywhere in the bulk. 
And the thing, by coinciding, the way they show this is that the set of these uh, expectation values has to be equal. So two states here, I apologize for this being so small, um, are called row one and row two. So like that could be a pure or mixed state. And the observables that are being, whose expectation value is being measured, they're all boundary observables. It's a string of Q uh, boundary observables just called O generically at times T1 through TQ evaluated at position, you know, angular positions, omega one, omega Q. And then sandwiched between the nth power of the boundary Hamiltonian and the mth power of the boundary Hamiltonian. So this is a whole bunch of different correlation functions. And if, if these two agree for all values of n, m, and q, and for any time in some arbitrarily short time interval between, let's say, zero and epsilon, then these two states have to be equal. So that's the claim. And I should make a few comments about the nature of the claim. So first, as I mentioned, it's carried out in perturbation theory, in fact, to leading order in Newton's constant. The argument uses in a crucial way the positivity of the Hamiltonian, that it has a ground state. And that's crucial for the analyticity property that's crucial in the argument. So when, it, when you have a function that's you know, zero, if you think of the spectrum of H as zero on the negative real axis, and that implies an analyticity property in time, and that's used in making this argument. They also use discreteness of the spectrum of mode frequencies. This is peculiar to asymptotically anti de Sitter space because of the gravitational potential well in anti de Sitter space. You can expand fields in the bulk in a mode in modes. And the spectrum in eigenmodes that are um, that have a discrete spectrum of frequencies, and that's like a technical handle that they use in the argument. It would have to be reformulated if it were to work in asymptotically flat space. They also, to use perturbation theory, they should restrict the excitation energy to be less than Planckian, um, or less than the ratio of the anti de Sitter radius to the Planck length. Um, and the proof, yeah, the pr method of proof also requires that the energy is bounded much more strongly than that by the logarithm of the ratio of the ADS length scale, the curvature scale to the Planck scale. Um, this is energy in ADS units. But they argue that this restriction is just a limitation of their method of argument, and they could generalize the argument to not need that. I'm not sure that's valid, but I would say even if the proof only works in this case, it's still remarkable. Um, so the basic idea behind it, let me say, is this. You, it's no surprise that by measuring at the, at the boundary, you can measure the total energy of the system in general relativity precisely because the total Hamiltonian is a boundary term. But just measuring like the flux through the boundary, you can measure the total energy inside. So if every state had a unique energy, then you could know, and if you knew you were in an eigenstate of energy, then just by measuring the energy, you would know what state you had. Of course, that's not good enough because first of all, there may be, there's generally degeneracy. There's more than one state with the same energy. And more importantly, what if we have a superposition of states of several energies? Then the relative phases in the superposition between those different states wouldn't be accessible by just measuring the energy at the boundary. Their result shows that, however, it is accessible if you measure all these observables. So what, what do these observables mean? They're, you're measuring quantum fluctuations, basically. Measuring correlation functions of quantum fluctuations. So I would say we should think of this as correlators of quantum fluctuations of the metric, and if there's matter, the matter fields at the boundary. And those are the nebulons. <laughs> so to go back to my picture of the Corvino gluing, I think, I think we can state this. So classically outside of here, the only thing you have is the Schwarzschild metric. So you don't know anything about the star inside. But now put in the quantum fields. 
A, and B, now demand that the quantum fields all together with gravity satisfy the Wheeler-DeWitt equation. The Wheeler-DeWitt equation is like, um, it's the quantum version of the elliptic constraint equation. So it ties together things here and here. In particular, what things does it tie? Every quantum fluctuation in the vacuum. If you imagine at this point of this star, there are vacuum fluctuations that are sensitive to the fact that there's a point there. And yet those are tied together with the vacuum fluctuations everywhere else by the Wheeler-DeWitt equation. So it's at least conceivable on thinking of it that way, that by measuring all the correlators of vacuum fluctuations with all the operators, you could think of them as all these multipole moments of the quantum fluctuations of the gravitational field and matter at infinity, that you actually would be able to distinguish this state let's say, from one without the star in there. And that's very peculiar to quantum mechanics. It doesn't appear in classical mechanics. Okay, so now we're almost at the end. I wanna go back. So far, I got rid of the black hole, but I should bring it back in and confront. Is there anything different when I do include a black hole in the paradox? There's definitely one thing at least that's different and it's a potential weakness of the argument as applied to the case of black holes. So imagine now we send in again this shell, but instead of just forming a resonance, we form a black hole. And it sends out early Hawking radiation and late Hawking radiation. And I'd like to make the argument again that boundary unitarity guarantees that any, any information that might come out with the late radiation is also available at all times. Well, remember the argument hinged on boundary unitarity, which hinged on the fact that we had a Hamiltonian description of time evolution and general relativity, such that evolving from one space like hypersurface to another, um, that evolution was generated by constraints plus a boundary term. But here we run into a bit of a problem with foliating the whole space time by space like hypersurfaces because precisely of the black hole. This um, objection to the boundary unitarity argument I've given so far was emphasized to me by Eric Curiel actually in a recent conference I attended where I spoke on this. So I wanna credit him with sticking my nose in this, um, in this problem and demanding that I address it, which I have to confess, I don't think I can address adequately, completely. So here's a picture of a Penrose type diagram of the space time here that corresponds to collapse. Here's the, the shell that collapses. It forms a purple uh, singularity that's space-like, at least in the symmetric background situation. This dotted line is the event horizon and the black hole is gonna evaporate like that one. At the end of evaporation, there's perhaps a tiny point where there's a curvature singularity, but infinitesimal size. And then after that, we just have empty space time full of, let's say, the Hawking radiation rattling around inside here. So if I try to foliate the space time by green space like hypersurfaces, it's no problem up to here. The surface probes inside the black hole horizon, even up to here. The surface can probe near the singularity, um, but we reach a limit. If I take a point that's past the uh, future boundary of the region, well, the region that's, uh, I can't see inside the horizon anymore with a space like hypersurface, then I'm stuck using something like this green hypersurface. And that goes to the new origin of space time. And it's not, there's a discontinuity in the foliation going from this hypersurface to that one. So that is kind of an interruption in the Hamiltonian evolution. And the question is, does it invalidate boundary unitarity? So from the viewpoint of this singularity, I think that's, I'm not very worried about it. That's just a little blip. Some quantum gravity, um, Description resolves that small singularity, presumably it heals. And I, because all we're using in boundary unitarity is diffeomorphism invariance, which is a very general principle, which I would expect survives 
the transition to full quantum gravity, I wouldn't be worried about that. But I'm more worried about the fact that it's not so much the curvature singularity there, but the, the discontinuity in the space-like foliation of a space-time. Suddenly, when we go from before to after that, we just lop off this piece of the, of the space-time. So I think that's a true weakness, and um, I can't really, the only way I can address it is to say that in the one fairly complete apparent quantization of gravity we have, which is ADS-CFT duality, which meshes perfectly with the boundary unitarity story so far. In that theory, it's just absolutely true that the boundary still evolves unitarily. So it's kind of plausible that this isn't a problem, but I, I would like to see a better argument for why we shouldn't be, well, for why it's not uh, a failure of boundary unitarity argument. And I, I can't give you an, an, uh, an adequate argument for that now. But what I can do is next, I'll show you, um, well, I, I won't do that. I'll address why even before we get to the end, you see the, previous, the, the accepted picture that is that this radiation is in a mixed state and we have to wait until the end to find the things that purify it. So uh, that led to the firewall paradox and that led to the apologia, apologia argument that nebulous degrees of freedom could not avoid the need for a firewall or some kind of interruption of disentanglement. So I wanna make an argument that uh, escapes that argument. So that involves the infalling observer questions. So the way the firewall argument worked was they just said, look, if I'm falling into the black hole at this time, well, let's say at late time, this Hawking particle is entangled with its partner inside the horizon if standard local quantum field theory holds. And yet this late Hawking quantum has to be entangled also with the early Hawking quantum because the whole thing is supposed to be in, in a pure state once I gather up all the radiation. Therefore, it must not be true after all that this early, late Hawking quantum is entangled with, the, with its partner. But if it's not entangled with it, then we don't have the vacuum state locally here because that entanglement is just a feature of the vacuum. And if we don't have the vacuum, we have some very highly excited state and that's the firewall. That was the, the argument for the firewall. It's a rather strange argument. It's one of these modifying the theory to escape a paradox arguments, which doesn't make sense. Because after all, if there is a firewall here, then the whole original reason for believing there's Hawking radiation in the first place is gone. So the whole picture like destroys itself. Their explanation doesn't, is self inconsistent, I think. But then, okay, fine. But what am I supposed to, how do I get around the argument? Um, and the way I would get around it is the following. It has to. So what's the acronym? Oh, AMPS. Uh, Almeri Merolf Polchinski oh, yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's the authors of the first paper. Um, so mm -hmm. I think th this gets to the root of how to resolve the paradox. How can it both be true that local quantum field theory is good to an extremely good approximation, and in particular that if I fall into the black hole at late times. I really will measure entanglement between this particle and one inside. And yet the fact that I have a boundary unitarity. So I think the issue is the following. It's, it's that if you're only asking a question about local quantum field theory, namely this entanglement with this, then that argument is perfectly fine. But if you're asking a question about the global state at the boundary and whether it's indeed a pure state taking into account all the quantum fluctuations of the nebulons and their entanglement with all the radiation, then you have to use diffeomorphism invariant observables, which this one isn't. I just said, oh, I jump in there and I measure the entanglement between this and this. Where am I doing that? Oh, let's say R equals 2M plus 0.1. What? I mean, that's just a coordinate location. So if we're asking a question whose very essence 
And the reason for being true, or for trying to verify it, relies on diffeomorphism invariance, then I shouldn't allow myself a statement to create a paradox I make a statement about an observable that's not really an observable. So what is the observable? Well, okay, if I have to specify where, who am I and how did I get there, and where is it that I'm measuring this correlation, I have to anchor that observable to something. So I could say, well, I jumped in from the boundary at a certain boundary time, and I fell along the geodesic, and that geodesic was picking up fluctuations in the metric all along the way and I have to integrate the geodesic equation and build this observable in a diffeomorphism invariant way that tells me exactly what correlation I'm measuring there. And by the time I finish doing that, it's not the observable that you thought it was when you're just talking about local quantum field theory here. It just isn't. So it's like, I believe this is another example of running into a paradox when, by talking about something that's mistakenly not really an observable in the theory. Yet, of course, if you just wanna do local quantum field theory at the collider in CERN or wherever in your laboratory, of course, you're fine doing it. You just better not ask a question about the entanglement with everything else in the universe at the same time. For that kind of a question, you had better use diffeomorph exactly diffeomorphism and very observables. At least that's my take on it. So that's it. Um, the conclusion is that truly uh, true gravitational observables are globally non-local. Quantum gravity Hilbert space does not factorize, even perturbatively. For some questions, local quantum field theory perfectly well suffices. But questions about global information require full non-local accounting. Thank you.